Um, and so welcome everyone who's joined us. Thank you for attending the candidate seminar for the Department of Epidemiology. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Alex McCourt, who is an assistant scientist in the Department of Health Policy and Management and Director of Legal Research for the Center for Gun Violence Prevention and Policy at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. McCourt is trained as a public health lawyer, having received his JD MPH from the University of Arizona, followed by his PhD in Health and Public Policy from the Hopkins School of Public Health. Dr. McCourt leverages his interdisciplinary background by combining legal research with quantitative methods to study instances in which law plays a role in shaping the public's health. Today, Dr. McCourt will be presenting his talk titled Using Public Health Law Research Methods to Evaluate State Laws Intended to Prevent Violence. Before I pass it over to Dr. McCourt, I want to remind everyone to please keep yourselves on mute and to hold questions until the end of Dr. Moore's talk. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really uh, excited and, and thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, meet all of you and, and to uh, give this talk today. Um, <clears throat> I'll be talking about some of my work Kind of using public health law research methods and, and legal epidemiology methods um, to evaluate state laws intended to prevent violence. <clears throat> you heard a bit about me from a uh, very kind introduction, um, but just for a, a little more context, I'm currently an assistant scientist at uh, Johns Hopkins in health policy and management, and I'm the director of legal research for the Center for Gun Violence Prevention and Policy. I'm also core faculty in the Center for Law and the Public's Health and the Center for Injury Research and Policy. Prior to joining the faculty at Hopkins, I got a uh, bachelor's in physiology and a JD MPH with a focus in EPI at the University of Arizona and my PhD in health and public policy at Johns Hopkins. In general, I am interested in the ways we measure and analyze the relationships between law and public health with a particular focus uh, especially in this talk on violence and gun violence. I come back to this uh, model a lot, which was developed about a decade ago by Scott Burris and others, this uh, logic model of public health law research. And I think it really illustrates the way that uh, law can affect public health in many different ways and how it's kind of a, a in some ways, a, a universal factor in public health, universal exposure. Um, it shows moving from lawmaking on the far left side through the laws themselves and different types of laws and legal practices, including enforcement and implementation of laws. And then the ways that those legal practices can shape uh, the social environment and the uh, physical environment and how both the legal practices themselves and the social and environmental changes can affect behavior. Um, all of these end up affecting uh, population health. I try to take a scientific approach to measuring and evaluating law. What this means is, is really using three key approaches. Uh, the first is legal mapping, which is cross-sectional or longitudinal studies of uh, state, local, federal, or even international policies. To do this, I use reproducible search and coding strategies to try to create a really accurate measurement of what law looks like um, and how it's changed over time. <clears throat> I couple this with legal analysis and interpretation. So this includes things like content analy analyses to look for key policy nuances and gaps and also possible incidental effects of laws. So many laws are designed to have a specific effect or to provide a uh, specific intervention but there are often unintended consequences to those laws and legal analysis and interpretation can help us identify those. Finally, I use uh, several different methods of quantitative policy evaluation. I try to use methods of quantitative analysis that allow us to draw causal inferences about these legal nuances that legal mapping and legal analysis can identify. Importantly, these are all iterative. They all kind of relate to each other and, and loop back around. So quantitative policy analysis helps us understanding, understand how we should design and undertake legal mapping and legal analysis. So to illustrate how I, I do this type of work, I'm gonna be talking about two studies that I am 
uh, currently involved in. One that I, well, one that I'm currently involved in and one that recently finished. Um, the first will focus on uh, the concealed carry of handguns and homicide as more of a legal mapping and analysis study. The second will be a quantitative policy evaluation looking at state background check laws. Gun violence is a major public health problem. There are uh, many different types of gun violence that are prevalent in the US, including urban violence, suicide, intimate partner violence, police violence, and mass shootings. Importantly, these are not mutually exclusive. They all uh, affect each other, and, and many different instances of violence can actually include multiple types, uh, multiple of these types. Gun violence is in some ways a uniquely American problem. It, the US sees much higher rates of gun violence compared uh, to peer nations uh, across the globe. Within the US, however, gun violence is distributed unevenly. There are certain populations, specifically black and brown populations that bear disproportionate burdens. Um, young black men have an extreme risk of dying uh, from gun violence compared to uh, young white men. Importantly, exposure and access to guns may be increasing. And we don't quite know how this will affect the spread of violence in the US. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been records broken in for uh, background checks by the federal background check system run by the FBI. Uh, and many online retailers of uh, gun parts and ghost guns are running out of, uh, of materials due to demand. So we're seeing an increase in the number of guns purchased, the number of guns that people are owning, and it's not clear how this will affect violence. There are political disagreements about the best policy approach to reducing gun violence. There are some that argue that we need laws that restrict access to firearms, that we need to make sure that only people who are uh, safe, who don't pose a risk, are those that have access to firearms. Others would argue that we need laws that facilitate access to firearms because firearms protect us. We are able to protect ourselves from crime or protect ourselves from violence if we are able to carry a firearm and own a firearm in the home. There's a federal infrastructure for regulating guns, but firearms are largely regulated at the state level. This is not necessarily surprising. This is a feature of the federalist system in, uh, in America. Many public health powers, Many law enforcement powers are reserved to the state, to the states. For this reason, guns, like many other public health uh, issues and topics, are primarily regulated at the state level. This means that we have a lot of variation. States vary tremendously in the ways that they regulate guns. This is unfortunate from a policy perspective because we have kind of a patchwork of gun policies across this across the nation. But it's interesting from an epidemiological perspective because we're able to take advantage of these natural experiments. In this talk, I'll be focusing on two categories of state gun laws, those that require a license to purchase and those that require a license to carry. The key similarity between these is they seek to use a licensing mechanism to identify and restrict the use of guns by those that the government has decided are at, high at ri highest risk of harming themselves or others. So of those, there are some laws that seek to restrict the purchase of guns. The government uh, enacts laws at the state level usually to keep those at risk of harming themselves or others from purchasing guns. The primary mechanism for this is background checks, background checks that uh, check criminal records, mental health records, and a, a plethora of other sources to determine whether someone meets the statutory criteria for uh, owning or purchasing a gun. Federal law requires background checks for purchases from federally licensed dealers, but not from private sellers. So if I want to buy a gun and I go to Walmart or to a gun shop, federal law requires a background check. I have to submit paperwork that is sent to uh, the National Instant Criminal Check System uh, that the FBI runs. They run a background check and usually comes back right away and says, that's fine, you can purchase it. And then the sale can proceed. However, if I want to buy one from a neighbor or someone I meet online as a private seller, we can do that without a background check and I'm not violating federal law. Most states don't regulate these private transfers, but as of July, 2021, this month, 22 states and Washington DC require background checks for at least some private gun transfers. There are two ways that states do this. The first is a point of sale comprehensive background check law. The second is a purchaser licensing law, or what I'll call a permit to purchase or PTP law. 
Point of sale laws or CBC laws typically require a background check at the point of sale. This is very similar to the federal policy that requires a background check for sales from licensed gun dealers. So if I wanna buy a gun from my neighbor, we go together, uh, usually to a federally licensed dealer that facilitates the background check. And once the background check comes back clean, we can uh, proceed with the sale. A permit to purchase law is slightly different. It requires prospective transferees to apply for a license. So when I wanna buy a gun from my neighbor, I have to apply to law enforcement uh, in advance. I undergo background check when I apply. I may have to get fingerprinted and maybe even take a training course. Once that's approved, then I can take that valid license to the private seller. Once they verify that it's valid, we can proceed with the sale. Absence a separate point of sale background check law, there is no point of sale check required in these states. So the permit is enough by itself. There are some states that have both systems. So states like Connecticut require you to have a permit to purchase a firearm. But even once you have a valid permit, you have to undergo another check at the point of sale. There are other laws that use some of these same mechanisms to try to keep those at risk of harming themselves or others from carrying guns in public. There are two types of public carry of guns. The first is open carry. And we're talking about open carry. It's, it's, what, we, it's what it sounds like. It's, you know, we saw it a lot about a year ago um, at protests of police brutality and also uh, of pandemic related restrictions when people were carrying guns visibly. You could see long guns that they were carrying on their backs uh, handguns on their hips, it was clear that they were carrying a gun. They were carrying them openly. The other type of public carry is concealed carry. And this is, again, what it sounds like. You can't see the gun. Typically, it's under clothing in a hidden holster or maybe in a backpack or another bag. Most states require permits or licenses to carry a concealed weapon, but the process differs. So some states make it very difficult to get a permit. And some states make it very easy to get a permit to carry a concealed weapon. This difference is one of the biggest gun policy debates and has been for the last 30 years. There's significant conflict over whether guns in public are a deterrent for violence or whether they catalyze it, whether they cause increased violence or whether they cause uh, otherwise nonviolent disputes to turn lethal. So what does the public health law approach to gun violence research look like? Well, Gun laws are hotly debated, but often misconstrued. They're often misunderstood uh, or, or even uh, misconstrued purposely for, for political purposes. To generate evidence-based policy that protects and improves public health, we have to use a scientific approach to measuring and evaluating law. This means using the three uh, methods that I mentioned earlier, legal mapping, legal analysis, and quantitative policy evaluation. The two projects I'm gonna talk about next uh, demonstrate the process and utility of this approach for studying violence. So first I'll be talking about an ongoing project um, that looks at the changes to the legal landscape for civilian gun carrying and effects on homicide. As I said before, most states require a permit or a license to carry a concealed gun, and they articulate specific permitting criteria. So if I want to carry a concealed handgun, in uh, my uh, current home state of Maryland, I have to go to law enforcement, I have to apply for that permit, and I have to meet specific criteria. I can't have been convicted of certain crimes, I can't have certain uh, mental health uh, records, and I have to undergo a background check. I may also have to undergo training and fingerprinting, all sorts of things. These specific permitting criteria vary a little bit from state to state, but what, what really, uh, is the key source of variation between states is how uh, the law enforcement makes their permitting decisions. So state concealed carry laws can be sorted into four broad categories. The strictest of these is no issue. And this means that they do not issue concealed carry permits. In fact, concealed carry is entirely banned. Next, we have may issue. And in these cases, you even if you meet these specific statutory permitting criteria, the state has discretion. Law enforcement has discretion to say, well, we think this person is a risk to the community or a risk to themselves, so we're going to deny their application. So even if you meet the permitting criteria, law enforcement is not required to issue a permit. They have discretion. Then there's shall issue. 
in under shall issue laws, states are required to issue the permit if you meet the permitting criteria. There's very little to no discretion uh, for, the, for state law enforcement. Finally, there are a few states that allow permitless carry. And what this means is that they allow you to carry a concealed gun without a permit. So as long as you are legally possessing that gun, you can carry it in public without going through any permitting process. These last two categories, shall issue laws and permitless laws, are also called right to carry laws, um, implying that there is a right to carry, uh, they create a right to carry a concealed weapon. Importantly, this is a bit of a misnomer. Um, under current uh, Second Amendment jurisprudence, under current Supreme Court opinions, there is no right to carry a concealed weapon in public. That may change with the current makeup of the court and, and an upcoming case they've agreed to hear in the October term. But as of now, there is actually no constitutional rights to carry. And for this reason, I, I try to avoid this term. These laws are hotly debated. There was some initial work in the 1990s by um, Lott and Mustard that argued, if we have more guns in public, we will see less crime. They uh, hypothesized and had some, some models that showed that violent crime would decrease if states made it easier to get a permit. However, this, uh, this approach had several flaws. Um, there were some flaws in, in the uh, construction of their models and then some assumptions they made. They also um, included uh, many, many, many demographic covariates that called into question whether or not that was appropriate. So some newer studies by um, several researchers, including John Donahue at Stanford, reworked the lot and mustard models. They uh, dug specifically into those specifications and found an improved set of specifications that uh, showed actually the opposite. These more robust models showed that states that made it easier to get a permit saw elevated violent crime rates. However, there were potential flaws in the legal analysis of this approach. So what uh, John Donahue, and others have done is that they have focused on right to carry laws um, and have defined them broadly. What this does is it improperly combines shall issue and permitless laws. Those two types of laws are very different. In one case, under shall issue laws, you are required to get a permit to carry a concealed weapon. Under permitless laws, you are not. So interpreting these statutes as kind of identical or, or as one and the same is inappropriate. It, it gives you a limited uh, understanding of what's really going on. Some of these newer studies also focus on overall policy categories instead of focusing on specifics. So they don't focus on the specific permitting criteria, but instead focus on discretion, whether or not law enforcement has discretion to say no to an application. The result of this, the result of this focus on discretion is that we have narrow policy implications. It's difficult for policymakers and researchers to know what to do with this because um, the implication, for example, of saying that uh, more discretion or less discretion increases violent crime is to say that law enforcement should have more discretion. But that's a very uh, you know, problematic conclusion and also a very uh, loose one. It's very hard to understand what that means. Specific permitting standards may actually help reduce violence. They may help keep high risk applicants from acquiring permits, and they may encourage responsible gun ownership and use. But to date, no one has looked in detail at these. So what we tried to do here was determine whether state concealed carry, policy, carry policies were associated with firearm homicide rates and whether specific permitting standards affected that association. So there were two pieces to this project. The first is longitudinal legal mapping and analysis, which is completed. And the other was a quantitative policy evaluation, which is in progress. So were you, you know, engaged in this kind of legal mapping and legal research and legal analysis, you have to ask legal research questions that inform your overall research question. Here, we tried to determine how states were regulated in concealed carry, what specific permitting standards they had, and how those laws were changing over time. To do this, I used standard search terms in uh, common legal research databases, including Westlaw, Pine Online, uh, LexisNexis, and state-specific websites. I retrieved state, uh, state policies for all 50 states from 1980 to 2020, although uh, we're working on updating it to 2021 now. 
The state laws were also coded for these overall permitting policies, those four categories I mentioned before, and for specific permitting standards. What kind of criteria did they have uh, in addition to the overall permitting policy? So I'm going to show a few maps here of how these have changed, how different states and people living in those states were exposed to these laws and how the laws, their exposure to these laws changed over time. So in 1980, it was very difficult to get a concealed carry permit. And in fact, in many states, it was completely banned. So the green states here banned concealed carry. This is on, on the left in 1980. The blue states uh, allowed concealed carry, but issued permits on a May issue basis, which means that it was pretty difficult to get a concealed carry permit. You had to show that you were a suitable person to be licensed and maybe show that you had a good reason to carry. The yellow states uh, made it much easier to get a concealed carry permit. And the red states uh, here, just Vermont, allowed uh, permitless carry, so did not require a permit to carry a concealed weapon. Between 1980 and 2000, there was a significant shift. And most of this happened actually in the 1990s amid a, a larger shift toward deregulation of, um, of the use and carry of guns. You can see by 2000 that the majority of the country now is much freer with issuing these permits. It's much easier to get a permit uh, in these shall issue states, these yellow states. There are still a few states that ban concealed carry, um, and there are still several states that make it difficult to get a permit, but more states are making it easier. That trend continued and actually accelerated over the last decade. So by 2021, this is, uh, this is as of this month, um, there are now eight states that have a May issue law that make it difficult to get a concealed carry permit. There are no states that ban concealed carry. The last two that banned concealed carry were Illinois and Wisconsin, and they uh, changed their laws about a decade ago. The majority of the country makes it very easy to get a concealed carry permit. Uh, as long as you meet the criteria, there's no discretion. So they, they have effectively removed discretion, the yellow states. The biggest switch over the last 10 years has been toward permitless carry. So you can see that there are now, uh, I believe, 19 states that allow um, the permitless carry of firearms. In 2000, there was just one state. Um, as of 2011, there were just, uh, I believe, three states. So over the last 10 years, there have been 16 states that have adopted this law, and more are coming. Texas has recently uh, indicated that it is going to switch to permitless carry. And so this is a, a huge shift toward uh, not just making it easier to get a permit, but doing away with a permit requirement entirely. So, okay, but looking at that again, what we can see is that there is a shift in terms of whether or not law enforcement has discretion. So what about these specific permitting standards? Well, the legal mapping and analysis revealed several common standards that were relevant to violence prevention. There were uh, prohibitions for those who were convicted of violent misdemeanors. Some states required uh, you to undergo training, maybe sitting in a classroom for a set period of time, learning about gun laws, gun safety, and related topics. Some states had a live fire requirement of, this, of these trainings. So you actually had to go to a range and fire a gun. And there were a few states that had kind of other broad suitability requirements, states that told law enforcement to only give licenses to those who were suitable to be so licensed, that were not a danger to the community or had a specific reason for wanting to carry a concealed weapon, perhaps a threat to their life or a dangerous job. Interestingly, the shift to shall issue meant that there were additional permitting standards. So as states got rid of discretion, they wanted to make sure that they were still uh, keeping people who were high risk from getting these permits, from carrying in public. So they increased the number of permitting standards. So alongside less discretion, we are seeing an increase in these criteria. And you know, as an example here, these are a, a few of the specific permitting criteria that, that we identified. On the left is 1980, and the right is 2019. So violent misdemeanor prohibitions, training requirements, and live fire requirements all increased over the study period. So the share of states that had each of these specific permitting criteria increased by uh, rather large um, numbers. However, these, these kind of looser other suitability standards that said, you know, you can't be a dangerous person or you have to have a, a good reason, 
decreased. So in other words, these more discretionary standards started to go away. The share of states that had them decreased. Though shall issue laws, their kind of initial research is showing that these shall issue laws may increase violence, it appears to be politically infeasible to return to a more restrictive scheme. And we may not want that. We may not want to return to a scheme where most states are allowing law enforcement significant discretion in how these policies are, uh, or how these permits are issued. The legal mapping reveals really important nuances in state concealed carry policies. These permitting standards may hold promise as a mechanism for reducing increases in violence. What we need next are rigorous quantitative analyses to fully understand the relationship between permitting standards and fatal outcomes. So that's what we're doing now. Our initial quantitative approach uh, was to take a model that is very prevalent in gun policy research, which is to uh, negative binomial regression with state and year fixed effects. But there are indications that this is not the best approach. Um, some recent uh, writing by Andrew Goodman Bacon and some others have found that two-way fixed effect estimators may be biased when there are variations in treatment timing. So you know, that's, that's virtually all of gun policy and really a lot of public health law and legal epi in general policies are not uh, enacted in a vacuum and they're usually not enacted all at one time. It's unlikely that we have you know, 20 states that all enact their policy at the exact same time. We're almost always going to have variations in treatment timing, which means that when we use these two-way fixed effects, we need to be really cognizant of the fact that our estimates might be biased. In addition, <clears throat> these models might not use the best counterfactual. Anytime that we are engaging in this type of study, we are, you know, rather than comparing uh, the state with the law to the state without the law, we end up comparing, you know, one state that adopted the law to a state that did not adopt the law. There are times when that can be useful and can help us generate causal inferences, but it's not necessarily the best estimate of the counterfactual scenario. So there's significant debate over the proper methodology for quantitative legal analyses like this, and this is especially true in gun policy. So our next steps in the quantitative analyses, and these are all ongoing right now, um, are to ex explore a few different approaches. One is using uh, difference in difference with multiple time periods using a methodology developed by Callaway and Santa Ana um, late last year. Another is using uh, the RAND specification. So RAND did a uh, simulation study where they determined um, which modeling approach had the best, uh, kind of was the most rigorous, most robust, um, best for gun policy studies. And then we're also going to be using uh, variations of the synthetic control method. So we'll be starting uh, just with regular kind of uh, traditional synthetic control methods, but also the augmented synthetic control method that uh, includes an outcome model. So that work is ongoing. And I, you know, I hope, I think we're planning uh, in the fall to be able to, to finally be publishing that. Um, and releasing those results. But to give you an idea of how these kind of analyses uh, actually work, I wanna talk about a second paper um, where I use synthetic control methods to evaluate the relationship between state background check laws and firearm homicide and suicide. So to do this, I'm gonna bring us back to background check laws, which was the other type of law that I talked about at the start. Um, this is, these are laws that regulate private sales of firearms at, the, at uh, the state level. So there's debate over the best policy approach for keeping guns away from those at risk of harming themselves or others. Do we wanna require a background check at the point of sale uh, where we all go together to a licensed dealer and they do a background check and then I get the firearm? Or do we want to require people to get a permit to purchase a firearm? Or maybe they, in some cases, have the permit for five years and can buy as many guns as they want during that five years but it includes a background check and training and it's a little bit more rigorous. Prior work has shown that there's very little evidence that point of sale background check laws have a population level protective effect. So these laws are quite good at actually uh, keeping guns away from those people who are prohibited. So individual studies have found that people who are prohibited from uh, purchasing a gun are stopped by these laws. So they try to go buy a gun and they cannot. The, the background check comes back and says that they can't buy a gun. But that is not necessarily translating to the population level. We're not seeing decreases in homicide or decreases in suicide or violent crime associated with point of sale background check laws. There's much stronger evidence for purchaser licensing or permit to purchase laws. However, 
Some of these studies have methodological shortcomings or have focused only on one policy. So these point of sale background check laws uh, studies have misinterpreted some of the state laws and have only included uh, certain categories of point of sale background check laws that are uh, somewhat inappropriate. Permits of purchase studies have been criticized for having small study periods and poor, uh, poor counterfactuals for some of the states that have adopted permit to purchase laws. So our goal in this paper that was published in, in AJPH in late 2020 was to estimate and compare the effects of state background check policies on firearm related mortality in four US states. We wanted to improve upon prior analyses of permit to purchase laws in Connecticut and Missouri and then apply similar methods to analyze point of sale only laws in Maryland and Pennsylvania. To do this, we use the synthetic control method. This is an alternative method for more accurately estimating the counterfactual or what would have happened in each state had a background check law not been implemented. It uses a series of pre-intervention outcomes and other predictors to generate a synthetic state. This synthetic state is a convex combination of weighted donor states that best approximates the pretreatment trends in the treated state. And when I say treated state here, what I mean is the state that adopted the law, the state of interest. Donor states are those states that were at risk of adopting the law. So in other words, they did not have the law, but could have adopted it throughout the study period. So to be eligible as a, as a donor state or a control state here, they had to not have the law of interest for the entirety of the study period. Once you have this model, you compare the synthetic control to the actual state in the post-treatment or the post-law period to generate an effect estimate. To evaluate whether there is a causal, whether you can make any causal inferences based on this effect estimate, you run placebo tests, which means iteratively running the same synthetic control model with each of the donor states. You can reliably make uh, a causal inference if what you're seeing uh, in the treated state is rare as compared to the placebo states. So your, your placebo tests uh, all generate, you know, a, a kind of range of effect estimates and your synthetic control uh, treated state estimate is much larger or smaller than the others, then you have, uh, you can reliably um, infer that you are actually seeing a causal relationship. The time periods for each state started 10 years before implementation of the law and extended as far as data availability and the state's legal environment would allow. So for example, in Pennsylvania, which adopted its background check law in 1995, we had a model that ran from 1985 to 2017. Maryland adopted its law in 1996, but uh, so we started its synthetic control model in 1986, but only ran through 2013. We stopped in 2013 because in late 2013, Maryland actually adopted a permit to purchase law. For this reason, we didn't want to have a, a changing legal environment. We wanted to capture the effect before that law went into, into place. Connecticut, adopted its law at the same time as Pennsylvania, the same year as Pennsylvania, but has a slightly different donor pool because it adopted a different type of law. Pennsylvania adopted a point of sale background check law. Connecticut opted, adopted a permit to purchase law. For that reason, its donor pool is, is bigger because there were 39 states that did not have a permit to purchase law throughout this time period. Missouri is the most unusual of these four states because it actually repealed its longstanding permit to purchase law in 2007. So its uh, study period was just from 1997 to 2016, and we had just eight donor states because these states could only be those that had a permit to purchase law, but were at risk of repealing it. Our outcomes were firearm and non-firearm homicide and suicide rates, which we obtained from death certificate data from the National Center for Health Statistics. Our models used every other year of pre-intervention outcomes and demographic predictors to estimate the synthetic control in the pre-treatment period. The demographic predictors differed for homicide and suicide based on uh, literature uh, related to firearm homicide and suicide, but included uh, unemployment, poverty rate, population size, uh, law enforcement employment statistics, age, sex, and other uh, similar predictors. So if you're interested in, in seeing some of these uh, graphs and results, I'd encourage you to check out um, our paper. We have a, a large appendix with many of these models because we ran many different iterations and, and uh, 
specifications to try to really drill down into what kinds of effects we were seeing. But here I'm just going to show uh, two. So on the left is Connecticut firearm homicide, and on the right is Missouri firearm homicide. The uh, solid line is the actual state, and the dashed line is the synthetic control. The vertical dashed line uh, indicates the year in which a policy or a law was adopted. So you can see on the left, Connecticut, uh, after adopting its law in 1995, relative to the synthetic control, saw a lower firearm homicide rate between 1995 and 2017. Missouri, on the other hand, relative to its synthetic control, saw a much higher firearm homicide rate from 2007 to 2016. We saw very different results for point of sale background check laws. So uh, here, we, there's a table of the, uh, the synthetic control model results from Maryland and Pennsylvania. So in Maryland, we saw a 17.5% increase in firearm homicide relative to its synthetic control. And in Pennsylvania, we saw a 21.5% increase relative to its synthetic control. Now, so in both of these states, we saw an increase in firearm homicide. In Maryland, this was not exclusive to firearm homicide. We also saw a large increase in non-firearm homicide. However, in Pennsylvania, it was exclusive. We saw actually a decrease in non-firearm homicide in Pennsylvania. So one thing we wanted to investigate here was the role of large urban centers in both of these states. We wondered if it was possible that Baltimore and Philadelphia were driving some of these results. So we ran these models again without those cities. We removed them from the outcomes and the predictors to see if that made a difference. It appears to make a a pretty substantial difference in Maryland. So um, the effect for firearm homicide goes uh, almost to zero, just down to 3.1% and non-firearm homicide to 10.8%. In Pennsylvania, however, without Philadelphia, we see an even larger increase in firearm homicide and a small increase in non-firearm homicide, suggesting that we're seeing slightly different things in each of these states after these laws. Again, nothing really consistent for suicide. In Maryland, there was a 15% decrease in firearm suicide and a 20, about 22% decrease in non-firearm suicide. In Pennsylvania, um, a 5% increase in firearm suicide and about a 12% decrease in non-firearm suicide. We saw much more consistent results for permit to purchase laws. So uh, in Connecticut, after it adopted its law relative to synthetic control, there was about a 28% decrease in firearm homicide and virtually no change in non-firearm homicide. For suicide, Connecticut saw about a 33% decrease in firearm suicide and just a 3% decrease in non-firearm suicide, although this was uh, really kind of middle of the road compared to the other placebo test results. Missouri, after its repeal, saw a, uh, relative to its synthetic control, saw a 47% increase in firearm homicide and a smaller 18% increase in non-firearm homicide. <clears throat> For uh, suicide, Missouri uh, saw a 23.5% increase relative to its synthetic control in firearm suicide and for non-firearm suicide, just a 7% increase. So overall, across these four states, permits to purchase laws were consistently associated with lower rates of both firearm homicide and firearm suicide. This is consistent with prior studies of these laws in Connecticut and Missouri, but this study provided additional years of data and new statistical models that uh, provided better estimates. The point of sale background check laws alone were not consistently associated with reductions. There's actually a suggestion of increases associated with these background check laws, but the mechanism for that is unclear. Um, some might argue that if you see these increases, it means that uh, people were unable to defend themselves. So background check laws made it too difficult to get a firearm, which means that people didn't have them and were then victimized uh, by uh, criminals with firearms. However, if that were the case, if that's what we were observing in those states, we would expect to see something similar in Connecticut and Missouri, because those laws, the permit to purchase laws, also make it difficult to get a firearm. So it's not clear uh, exactly what's happening here in Maryland and Pennsylvania, um, but it may be that it's something that our models are not capturing. So, okay, if these laws both require background checks for private sales, why, why should we expect to see 
different effects. Well, licensing or permit to purchase laws often require more robust vetting. They require fingerprinting. You often have to undergo training. It takes a lot longer and it's more expensive. Point of sale background check laws are much more limited, especially when the state data sources available for background checks are constrained. They rely heavily on these background check systems. So if reporting from law enforcement or from uh, mental health records is not adequate, then uh, these background check systems will not, have, will not be accurate. These background checks may be necessary to prevent access to firearms for those that are prohibited from possessing, but they're likely insufficient without licensing. There are a few limitations to this work. Uh, there were a limited number of policy changes uh, as you know, there's kind of a limited number of states that are adopting these laws, especially over the last uh, couple of decades. The control pool for Missouri was limited because many states don't have these permit to purchase laws and uh, they're not repealing them. We also use longer post-law periods than many people do when they use the synthetic control method. Many people cut it off at 10 years. Um, we used a longer, post-law period, we used as much data as we possibly could, which may stretch the ability of synthetic control method to accurately estimate the counterfactual at the tail end of those study periods. However, this is a rigorous statistical method. Um, we were able to contrast firearm and non-firearm outcomes to assess specificity of firearms. There's also similar time period for three policy changes. Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut all adopted their law in 1995 or 1996. The fourth policy change was about 12 years later in 2007, but it was a repeal, which allowed us to contrast the adoption of a permit to purchase law in Connecticut with the repeal of one in Missouri. So what are the next steps of this research? Well, um, we wanna engage in further analyses of the specific elements of purchaser licensing laws. So similar to the concealed carry mapping and analysis that I described in the first part today. We also need to look at equity concerns. These laws may appear facially neutral, neutral, but may not be applied equitably. They rely on systems with a history of entrenched racism. There are several states that afford very broad discretion to law enforcement in making licensing decisions. And anecdotally, I've talked to several different uh, sheriffs in many states who uh, you know, have given me the impression that these systems may not operate uh, free of bias and discrimination. So we need to figure out how can these licensing laws and similar laws be implemented in a manner that is effective, but is equitable. In general, what I think these two studies show is that law is dynamic and nuanced in the way that it affects populations. Licensing in general may help reduce gun violence, but we need to know a lot more about it. We need to know about how the specifics work and how people are actually experiencing this licensing process. Also, state and federal laws can prevent violence, but it's important to understand the ways that they can foster violence. An approach that couples scientific measurements of law with quantitative policy analysis can help us both assess the ways in which laws shapes the public health and also help us inform evidence-based interventions and policies. Uh, I want to quickly acknowledge uh, this list of collaborators in the presented work and also uh, acknowledge that funding for the work came from the Joyce Foundation and the New Venture Fund. Um, I'm currently engaged in work that uses each of these approaches. Um, I'm working on um, gun policy and violence policy studies and substance use policy that uh, policy studies that use legal mapping and legal analysis and interpretation. Um, I'm also using quantitative policy methods, uh, evaluation methods to analyze substance use policy and, uh, and gun policy. And I'm interested in exploring the relationship between those two, substance use and gun violence, and also uh, social policy as a driver of violence. Uh, again, I'm very interested in, in public health law research methods and collaboration. I'm also interested in teaching and training um, related to these uh, same uh, same topics, and I'm, I'm uh, familiar in teaching them and also in advising students that are interested in them. Um, so that uh, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions, and um, thank you so much. I, I really uh, enjoyed getting a chance to do this. Thank you so much, Dr. McCourt. Um, 
I don't see any questions in the chat, but I'll start by asking a question. Um, in, in one of your last slides, you mentioned the importance of health equity at certain segments of the population that are going to be more vulnerable to um, the effects of some of these laws or lack thereof. I, I'm curious what your next steps are in this realm and how you plan to think about these, these types of social issues. So I think it's, it's essential to do that kind of work when you're, especially when um, you're looking at laws and, and policies that involve law enforcement, um, given a, the kind of the history of, of uh, systemic racism. Um, you know, this is this, I've been at a couple um, different kind of panels where we've been talking about this and I, and I, I met a sheriff, um, I, I won't say where from, but said, that told me that when people come in to apply, he will look at them and tell people before they apply, don't even bother applying. I'm not going to say yes to your application, which is clearly problematic. It creates an environment where racism, discrimination, and bias can directly feed into who has access to uh, a, this, these systems, concealed carry permits or background checks or guns in general, and who doesn't. And though the goal should be to reduce gun violence, we need to not do it in a way that reinforces these uh, systemic um, uh, disparities. So um, we're doing a couple different things. One is to examine uh, the processes for actually getting the permits and opportunities for discrimination bias to play a role there. Um, I'd also like to, uh, in the future, I'd like to do a study where we actually talk to people on the ground, talk to people who are actually experiencing this process to see what that is like. Um, unfortunately, uh, gun, kind of all gun related data, especially gun ownership related data is very hard to come by. So we can't look at, you know, what percentage of people apply and get their permits uh, compared to population numbers. We can't get that broken down by race, by age, by gender. Um, but I think we should do our best to approximate that. Um, so there, you know, there are a few different approaches to, uh, to looking at that, but I think that, um, you know, we need to do more nuanced quantitative analyses too, to see how different populations are, are experiencing these laws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I, um, you know, had only recently been thinking more about this and about the effects of policy. Uh, I don't know about gun policy, but policy in general and um, what that tends to do in terms of policing in communities of color. And what you just told me about what the sheriff said to you is, um, I guess, it, yeah, it really gets me thinking more about this. So thank you for that response. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Chingy. I'm an injury epidemiologist I have a two questions. The first question, um, recently, Scott Burris in New England Journal of Medicine perspective on legal epidemiology of pandemic control. He called for more research funding for um, legal epidemiology, especially funding for career development. So I want to ask you, what's your plan to, to pursue NIH funding to support your career? The second question relates to the gender inequality, the uh, gun violence related um, homicide, especially women's death. What's the opportunity and the barrier to look at those to link with maternal death? In this country, each year, 700 women die, um, pregnancy associated death. And uh, so, uh, partner violence occupies a big portion of those homicide cases. So how you link those together, and uh, which state or which network may support this type of uh, research uh, investigation? Thank you. Sure, those are both uh, fantastic questions. Thank you. Um, but that I I'm very familiar with the um, the Scott Burris uh, piece that you mentioned. Um, I think it's really fantastic, and I and I think that it's um, important not just for uh, you know, pandemic related public health law research, but in general, uh, this kind of legal epi research. And so um, <clears throat> I absolutely agree that that there needs to be more funding for professional development of people that are interested in this. And, and uh, 
I actually think importantly for people who are public health lawyers, but also not public health lawyers, people who are interested in this in general. Um, so my, my plan is to pursue uh, two streams of funding. One is, uh, you know, what uh, you might call maybe foundation funding for the type of gun violence research, but also NIH funding and, and, and in a couple different ways. One is um, through work that I've been doing related to uh, substance use policy and relating that to substance use and violence and looking at how different policies affect those, uh, those populations. But also there are increases in government funding for uh, injury and violence. We're seeing much more funding come up. And so I'm really excited about those opportunities. I think um, that there's a lot of promise there. Um, in terms of your second question, uh, that's such an important question. The, the role of, of guns in kind of intimate partner and domestic violence is, is enormous. There's, a, there's an incredible link. Um, some prior work I've done has looked at the way that um, that uh, firearm laws can affect intimate partner homicide. And so some of those cases would involve um, a, a pregnant individual um, and or uh, a parent in general. And so one of the mechanisms, kind of one of the problems here is that that you know, one of the common responses when someone is experiencing um, intimate partner violence is to get a, an order of protection you know, to try to get a protection, protective order. But those orders aren't always enforced. So under federal law and many state laws, you're not supposed to have a gun if you are under one of those orders. But in many states, they don't enforce it. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes to get the gun. And, and that can be a time of high kind of volatility and, and big risk for, um, for uh, the kind of the victim of the abuse or the violence. Um, so I think it would be fascinating to look at that. And I, and I do think that that's an area that um, could be studied getting for, using funding from either of those two streams. I think that foundations would absolutely be interested in that. But I also think that government funders are very interested in, in these specific types of violence that are, that are particularly bad. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me. I can't, yeah. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, so uh, a couple of questions about where to find uh, populations and uh, the kind of data that might be helpful. So everybody who debates this issue talks about the difficulty of, of having laws in one state when the next state doesn't. So th with that as um, background, I wonder about uh, municipalities, counties, uh, local jurisdictions, given that city of Los Angeles has 13 million, New York has 8 million. If we look at the country and ask a, a separate set of questions in terms of looking for longitudinal data, if it's possible, thinking of somebody who's trying to get a master's, for example, to look at some of these ordinances. And I don't know, since I have no clue, I've never looked to see if there is variation and of course some consistency as you move from municipality to municipality and ask essentially some of the same questions you're asking. So that's one kind of question. Another is that in general injury research, especially related to traffic, classic analysis has been a uh, time series analysis. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's those kind of, might this might fit because it seems to me you might be able to find longer series if you broaden uh, the search for useful natural experimental populations. And in a, in a comparable sense, I don't know if you look over, I, I think the overseas issue, given our gun culture, it may be irrelevant, but I, I am really interested to see how the Australians, I mean, it's such a dramatic change once they just cracked down and everything went out the window. Uh, I don't know if they did any research to tease out. Did it work at every single level? It must have because gun deaths now compared to before the Tasmanian tragedy have got to be unbelievably lowered. So enough of that, but thanks again for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I think, so um, on, on the, the second question, you know, the Australian, um, experience, I think, is so 
it really illustrates what this kind of you know, strict policy can do. But um, you know, some of the research I've seen on it has has really illustrated how important it is to keep in mind how different the kind of the politics and the culture and how central guns are to the kind of American culture, um, which makes it, it, it difficult. And, and I think the political feasibility too, you know, what they did is not a feasible thing in the US. Um, in terms of the first question, looking at kind of municipalities, I think that's such a, you know, kind of an exciting area um, in, in multiple ways. I think, you know, there are, uh, some municipalities have different laws than the state and also different laws than each other. And, and that can vary because some states say that, you know, you can't do this, right? You, you know, um, but there are some municipalities that do things differently. And there are some that are so kind of unique, right? They're much bigger than, they're so big that it, they drive a lot of what happens at the state level. Um, but it can be particularly important, I think, when we're talking about these, um, these types of laws that I was talking about today, where local law enforcement, like a sheriff, has a lot of power in determining who gets a gun and who doesn't. And, you know, how gun laws are enforced and how they're not. And, you know, we saw in Baltimore a few years ago that there was a, a group that was in charge of finding guns and getting them off the street. And they totally abused that power, right? They were robbing people, they were selling drugs, they just completely abused the power. And so, you know, looking at a state law, you don't experience that. You don't see that those nuances and those um, those different elements. And so I think it's, uh, you know, I think that that is another area that needs uh, more attention. I'd like to support you on that because uh, I've done some research on physician behavior, social worker behavior, and court of appeals judges behavior. And there was things that were surprising in each of the studies in that we make assumptions about what it means to be a professional of a certain category. What is really interesting is the way the professional thinks may not be something that we would think they would be thinking. Uh, and in other words, if you were to find a way to, uh, without great expense, to, uh, to find a good way to evaluate police cultures, uh, and there's, there's various tools available to do that, to see how much the police culture, that is the average view towards uh, guns and their either control or lack of control in various police agencies, whether that would be a major um, influential variable to control for when you go forward. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's you know it's it's interesting because I think that that um, in some ways you know I was saying that that a lot of gun data, ownership data of guns and government gun data is difficult to come by, and I think that without kind of surveying or interviews, I think police data is very similar. It can be very difficult to find out. Um, what's going on. But I think through, you know, kind of interviews or surveys, I think that's, that's something that absolutely could be valuable. All right. I just want to be respectful of the time. We're at the top of the hour. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. McCourt, for sharing your research with you. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Thanks so much. Virtual applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.